Good morning. Good morning from Atlanta, Georgia, where all the Georgia peaches are. We are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia today. <laughs> Our mother-in-law talks like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know a ministry that uh, the Georgia on my mind was the theme song for their ministry. Well, we're in Georgia, and we love Georgia. It's Hello, so Priscilla. Hi, Priscilla. Hello, yeah. Casey. Oh, there's too many to name. Our little Laurel Ann and Will and Lee Barfoot. There's and just Lee too many Katie. And <laughs> we'd have to go on and on, and we'd miss our broadcast. Yeah. Ooh, we don't have any more time. <laughs> Coming to a town near you one day. <laughs> This is the Morning Light Bible Study where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back, where you come to the place where you experience the fact that when you become a person of the book, the narrative drives the experience, and you walk in a, in a experience in life of a biblical caliber. Uh, we're continuing, and bear with us if we have bandwidth issues uh, today we're using a backup recording sometimes in hotels. Uh, uh, we have uh, problems with service interruption. Nonetheless, uh, we are continuing with 30 days of speaking in tongues. We did 30 days of praise a few months ago. And it's just an overture of five minutes of exercising the gift of glossolalia, as the theologians have termed it. Because when you pray in tongues, you pray out the mysteries of God. Uh, many people talk about how Paul censored those that spoke in tongues, but he really didn't. In 1 Corinthians, he, he told those people in Corinth, he said, you are uh, going overboard in speaking in tongues, but in the same breath, he said, but, you know, as a matter of fact, I speak in tongues more than the rest of you. And so uh, when we pray in the Spirit... We stir up the gift of God. You know, that word stir in the Bible, it says stir up the gift that's in you. It's cultivate. Cultivate. We, we expect it to fall on us like a, a psychic experience. Yeah. Uh, we validate spiritual experiences not by process, but by what uh, an anthropologist would call a crisis experience. In other words, it just drops on you almost without your volition, and it just, you shake, rattle, roll, <laughs> you know, what the Cain Ridge Revival people said, you have the barking exercise, and the running exercise, and the dancing exercise, and the singing exercise, uh, and it's wonderful when you have a crisis experience like that, it doesn't mean crisis as in trouble, what it means is a spontaneous, ecstatic experience that just takes you, and you come to yourself washed up on the shores of the aftermath of God getting a hold of you and you just revel in in the afterglow. That's wonderful and you can have that. Amen. But in the meantime, there's a such thing, it's not the only way to access the glory. You can access the glory by outcome or you can access the glory by process. And accessing the glory by process means you stir up, you cultivate, plant, water, harvest, uh, proper elements, you fertilize, you get proper light, understanding, uh, proper refreshing, and you are fully engaged in shepherding the process like the, the, those that Jesus told the parable. He said he gave them talents, and what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the gift of tongues? Well, we're going to use it. <laughs> and uh, say, so well, what if, it, what, if it's, uh, what if I'm in the flesh? Well, he said he would pour out in Joel. Kitty always talks about this. He would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. You have to be in the flesh to speak in tongues. Amen. Speaking in tongues is really simple. You have two minds on the inside of you if you're born again. You have the mind of the natural that dwells in your soul and the mind of the spirit that dwells in your human spirit where God sits enthroned. Your natural mind and your soul has an ongoing connection and control over the speech center of your brain. Amen. However, because you're born again, there is another much unused capacity that languishes in the lives of most believers where the mind of the spirit can reach out and detach uh, the white knuckle grip that the natural mind has on your speech center and says, excuse me, I'm going to use that for a few minutes and 
He's, he's, <laughs> no, you can't have it. No, you can't have it. And make your natural mind back off and allow the mind of the spirit. And just to chagrin your natural mind when the mind of the spirit takes you, your speech center, he talks in a language that your natural mind can't understand. And he just thumbs his nose at the natural mind saying, no, you don't get to. The, uh, we do not quantify what goes on in our life by what your head can understand. What God told us one time, do you want peace or do you want understanding? You can't have both. You have to learn to walk in the things of God outside the void of your own limited, finite, natural understanding. And speaking in tongues is a wonderful exercise how to get that done. So five minutes. Yes, Father God, we praise your name. We glorify you. We acknowledge you. We give thanks well. Thank you, Jesus. We pray out the mysteries of God. We give thanks well. We thank you. We allow your spirit to speak through us. Let there be cooperation between the mind of the spirit and the mind of the natural man. We cultivate the gifts, God. We stir up the gifts. We stir up the gifts that are within us. The gift of speaking in tongues. Lord, provoke those that are listening. Provoke those that belong to you, Lord God, to allow your mind, the mind of the Spirit, to have access to their vocal cords, to the speech center of their brain, for the articulate speech of the Spirit, not understood or comprehended by the natural mind, but comprehended in heaven. Rosa <laughs> <laughs> 
Mutende, a lover of intentions. Give Nanana, Holy Spirit, Karabahasha, and the Lord of the Sose, Parabasta, Makuruba Suna, Mashena, Echo Church, Church, We worship and honor you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Father, for that gift, the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. When Jesus ascended, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit, whom my Father will send, will be with you. Thank you so much. See, you don't have to talk about what you demonstrate. And we need to begin to re-evaluate our faith and how it works out in our life, not by talking about, but by demonstrating. It's the difference, for instance, between the Gospels and the Epistles. The Epistles talk about Jesus. The Gospels are direct exposure to the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're so epistle-oriented uh, that we forget uh, what the church was and what the Gospel was up until the time that Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. That's not disparaging the Apostle Paul, but if we get so immersed into the technical aspects and the cultural aspects of the faith as outlined in the epistles, that we lose our experience. God wants us to walk in demonstration. Demonstration of spirit and of power. Just praying in tongues is a part of the demonstration of spirit. And yes, it's foolishness to the unbeliever, but we're not unbelievers. That's right. And uh, it's all about uh, pointing out that there's something beyond the norm. And I'm amazed when I hear stories of... Uh, Movements that were birthed in the fires of Pentecostal revival that are absolutely apoplectic and paralyzed with fear about letting God be God in their midst. They have such a tight grip on uh, what they think church is supposed to look like that they're absolutely in mortal fear of anything getting out beyond their control and they put, they just have a uh, fire hose of unbelief that mm -hmm. they drench anything that looks like something that they cannot directly control. Folks, that really has to change. And we have to quit supporting uh, leadership that thinks that way. We have to be, you know, I, I've seen people cry out, oh, my church is dead, my church is dead, but they've been going there for four generations and wouldn't think of going somewhere else. And it's really not about going somewhere else because you could jump out of the frying pan into the fire. It's about you do like the disciples did. They would just went out and they allowed the impact of who Jesus was to become evident in their life. And they got hauled in by the leaders and beat half to death. And, you know, they didn't just get a good tongue lashing. Well, you're not going to do that in this church. I understand, Pastor, but understand this. I'm going to do what God says do. If you want to call the police and escort me out, that's okay. But I'm going to do what God said do. The, you know, we make uh, the, the protocols of the church are not infallible. We do not obey the protocols of the church when the protocols of the church violate the freedoms of the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And uh, that doesn't mean we pick a fight. Uh, that means you obey God, and if it gets you in trouble for breaking the protocols of the church, then you bear it with love, That's right. and you bear it with grace, and you rejoice that you've been counted worthy to endure some, uh, some uh, turbulence in your life for the cause of... Uh, of Christ. Uh, who's who's listening to me? Yeah, we hear you. It's time to allow the river of the Spirit to break out of the banks. You know, the, the church today, it's almost like uh, the Corps of Engineers. 
uh, they, they have all of these uh, groundworks trying to control the Mississippi River. And those of us that have lived on the Mississippi know it doesn't work. <laughs> they put up flood control in one area and it breaks out in another area. They grip that area and get that nailed down and it breaks out in another area. Well, in the day that we live in, the Spirit of God is breaking out of all the banks that have been set for it. And unfortunately, those that claim to be the inheritors of the move of the spirit and they think that if God's going to do anything he's going to do it in their church they're the ones that are quenching the spirit more than any other people out there in what we would call nominal churches they're hungry they're dry they're crying out they're open they're looking for something okay. whereas those that ought to be the testimony and the example of what they're looking for are shutting down anything that doesn't take place in the pulpit with a smoke machine and uh, you know a professional uh, musician or minister up there being the the arbiter of it it's time to jettison church as performance and come back to being the anointed community that we once tasted of back in the days of the charismatic movement and that we see exemplified in the first century church and that's my stump that we actually are going to read first second Samuel chapter Chapter 8. It's a good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> in 2 Samuel chapter 8, what do you do when victory comes? In this chapter, David takes the victories that God had given him, and he moves forward in the promises of Abraham. His enemies have ceased to war with him. That was mentioned in the last chapter, but he does not cease to war with God's enemies. He does not rest or accept compromise. There will be times that the enemy will cease pursuing you, and the temptation is, well, let's just leave well enough alone. Let's, you know, you don't, you don't uh, take off your shoe and beat it on the, uh, a hornet's nest. Uh, but uh, that was not David's choice. David boldly rises up and moves forward to take the full inheritance that God gave to the people through his promises to Abraham in Genesis 15. You know, I get this a lot when I talk about... Uh, political process. God told me years ago, Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, which is politics, not by power, which has to do with military power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And I've made the statement that the church in the Western world has prostituted itself to the political process. Instead of going to their knees, they're going to the voting booth and the, uh, uh, the uh, lobbying system to try and change things. But that's not how change comes. Change comes when God raises up anointed people and anointed leaders to confront the nations and say uh, things are not going to get better until you respond and acquiesce to what God is saying. Like Elijah who said it's not going to rain in this nation except by my word. I've, I've seen, I've met nation confronting mm -hmm. prophets who've had those experiences in our day. And of course we don't know their names because the people that put the names out are not very pleased with such prophets and such apostles. But trust me, they're, they're there. God's put us in connection and in friendship with prophets who've prophesied in the White House, prophesied before parliaments, prophesied to cities, and the things that they said came to pass. And uh, But the point uh, being is we have to put our confidence in God's solution. People will say, well, aren't we supposed to be involved in the political process? No, the political process is supposed to be involved with us. Yes, amen. We're not supposed to go knocking at their door with our hat in our hand. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be looking over their shoulder, trembling at the people of God who are demonstrating the kingdom of God, such as the first century church mm -hmm. that in three generations brought the known world to its knees yes, at the foot of the cross and changed human history. Yes. That is the plan and the purpose of God. Just in the days of the Caesars, God brought the Caesars to their knees at the foot of the cross through a church that knew how to pray and knew how to die for their faith. And in the day that you and I live in, God is bringing the uh, the representative democratic republics of the West to their knees at the foot of the cross and at the community of believers that is ordained to represent him there. Amen. And there will not be rain in their nations except they pay fealty to the king who sits upon the throne says the father and you have been called to be ambassadors to be representatives of that anointed demographic that does not draw their 
identity from the parties of man, but from the kingdom of God. It's a new day, says the Father, a day of the Davidic covenant being brought to bear to full manifestation in our generations when we learn how to pray and when we learn how to die for our faith. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for speaking to your children. So let's begin <clears throat> Second Samuel 8, verses 1 through 6. Okay. And after this, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Methagama. 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 Meth lab. They had a meth lab oh, there. Oh dear. Out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death and to with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants. Moabites, rather, came, became David's servants that brought gifts. David smote also had uh, Azar, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven hundred horsemen and twenty thousand footmen. And David ho Ham hamstringed. He hamstringed all the oh, chariot horses. Oh my goodness but reserved of them for a hundred chariots. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to succor uh, Hadadazar, king of Zobah, David slew the, of the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became the servants to David and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. So if you just go there, he'll <laughs> preserve you. Jesus. If you're not being preserved, you have to ask yourself, maybe you ought to be going. He went, He was preserved when he went. Oh, I don't have all the answers. Well, do you want peace or do you want understanding? You can't have both. If you confine yourself to only moving forward in what you understand, then you are limiting God to only reproducing in your life what you've experienced. If you want what you've never had before, you must be willing to do and to go where you've never been and to do what you've never done. Amen. Because the kingdom doesn't come with observation. The kingdom is a kingdom that responds to what you do. So that's why Peter, when he vaulted over the rail, Jesus didn't tell him to do that. Peter asked a question there was only one answer to. Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Jesus chuckles. He says, well, it's me. It's and me. here he comes. Don't you know Jesus ha had just a, a giggle whenever he saw Peter do and that. Courage. He said, probably not the right thing to do, but you got to admire his style. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at the other 11 guys up there, wishing Peter hadn't have done that, wondering what they're going to do, dragging his drowned body up, taking it home to his mama. <laughs> And, and Peter didn't didn't do everything right, and he almost faltered, but he was there to bail him out because he was getting engaged with uh, doing something, moving toward. I want to move toward him. I'm going to do something if I do it wrong Amen. because he's going to be there to pull me out of the billows if I begin to sink or if you begin to sink. That's right. He's got bail money. <laughs> <laughs> so in the previous chapter, the Lord gave David rest from all of his enemies. Now, if that is the case, why is this chapter filled with war? He gave him rest with all of his enemies. See, because his enemies quit attacking him, that didn't mean David quit attacking them. Just because the Lord gives you rest from your enemies doesn't mean you give your enemies rest. God is not interested in a truce with the devil. God's idea of peace has nothing to do with compromise. In Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, we find a list of the seven spirits of God. The very first one is the spirit of the Lord. God's basic nature is one of lordship. His basic nature is to subdue and to rule. He's like when you were out in the world and you'd go to the bar with your buddy, you know, the little short wiry one that was always picking a fight. And you guys got up against 10 guys way bigger than you, and you grabbed your buddy, and you haul him out to the car. And just about the time you got in the car, he turns around and says, No, come on, let's go back and get him. We can whoop them all. We're not leaving till we whoop them. God never moves away from a fight. The, the good fight is the one you win. God is one of these guys that has an A-type personality. He walks into the room, and he won't leave till it's all about him. Amen. <laughs> and 
that's not my kind of personality. That's not who I am. But yet I usually wind up with friends like that. And my friend God is like that. He's the most A-type personality that I know. His nature is to come in and not to back away from a situation until his lordship is established. So you're asking God to get you out of the mess, to get you off that job, to get you out of that circumstance, to get you out of that place of contention. You're crying out for an exit strategy, and God says, okay, I'll get you out just as soon as I whoop all of these things that are making you want to leave. As soon as I give, put everything that makes you want to leave under your foot and declare you total victory total victor, so that when you leave, they're not mad that you're staying, they're mad that you're leaving. <laughs> because that's just who your papa is. I, uh, many times I'm in a position, I just want, can we just compromise? And I hear in the back of my mind, God's talking to me, he says, your father has this problem, he thinks he's God, and we play till I win. <laughs> and so the very base nature of God is one of lordship. His basic nature is to subdue and to rule. He put you in your life like he put Adam in the garden to tend and to keep it and to subdue it. And that word subdue means to engulf. Fire engulfs everything it touches. Everything. And our God is a consuming fire from his loins up and from his loins down. And guess what? The angels are ordained to be ministers of those who are also uh, ministers of the flame of fire, the scripture tells us. Amen. So there's a fire in you that will not be contained until it engulfs everything, till it stamps your name and God's name and God's glory on every situation in your life, whether it's your uh, contentious backslidden mean-spirited spouse or those backslidden children that threaten not to let you see your grandkids if you don't quit talking about this God stuff or on that job where they'll tell you to check your religion at the door or in that church situation that every time God moves they're throwing a water cannon on it and the Spirit of the Lord says I'm not leaving till I engulf everything in that place yes. until I bring everything that's not uh, a constituent component of my nature to dust and ashes and establish my domain and then he'll say okay okay chant now you can leave like the Cajuns say now now you can leave <laughs> see that's the nature of God he expects his enemies to be made his footstool and not his border see at that point the enemies were David's border he's not going to accept enemies at your border he will not accept anything until they are your footstool until that lost belligerent condition and that unsafe spouse is your footstool. Until that difficult situation with the school and those kids are your footstool. Until every contrary component, circumstance, situation, or person is at your feet groveling in obeisance, not to you, but to the glory of God that defends you in everything that you do. Yes, Lord. Thank you for the victory. I don't know how to teach this dry, folks. Uh -uh, <laughs> oh, boy. So we see then that David understands this. And that while David's enemies stopped attacking him, he did not stop attacking them. The first assault was against the Philistines. The word Philistine means to wallow. To wallow. You know, it's just like the Jebusites were the last ones defeated, and their name means to be downtrodden. You gotta, you gotta defeat the Philistine first, and you've got an inner army of Philistines that wants to make you wallow in self-pity, wallow in depression, wallow in in helplessness. You gotta defeat the Philistine. And you gotta conquer. When you conquer inwardly, everything outwardly is just a cleanup operation. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So they had harassed and molested the Israelites for many years, and so David rises up against them and he subdues them. And it's interesting that at this point, we've been talking to you about how Saul did not inquire of the Lord, but David did. And when David did, things turned out differently for him, but now he's come up another level because he, there is not recorded that he asked God one thing. Do you realize that David understood his borders to be from the Nile to the Euphrates? Mm -hmm. wow. And he didn't ask God one single thing. He took a prophetic word that was given to his grandpappy Noah and a prophetic word that was given uh, to his grandpappy Abraham and he understood 
that his boundaries were from the Nile to the Euphrates. He says, that's good enough for me, and off he went. There is a level in your life, a time in your life, where God is going to prosper everything you put your hand to, uh, just like he didn't allow Samuel's words to fall to the ground. Let me explain to you. You've got to understand where David got his anointing. He received his anointing through a man whose words did not fall to the ground. Right. There's a level of the prophetic where I am saying something because it's going to happen, but then there's a level of the prophetic where it happens because I say it. Mm -hmm. And actually, I started out with that level before I even knew what I was doing. That's right. The very first prophetic word I ever gave that came to pass, God told me, he says, if you say it, I'll do it, and if you won't say it, I won't do it. Did. Now, that's how that anointing sits on a prophet, but it, it, it causes the things he says to come to pass. But when that anointing, that same anointing sits on a king, it causes the things that he does to be backed by God. Amen. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. A prophet's anointing is in saying, a king's anointing is in doing. And so God used Samuel to give that anointing to David. Samuel had an anointing that his words did not fall to the ground. He took that mantle and imparted it to David, and it caused the things that he did, everything he did to prosper. And he has now come into his full anointing. He was anointed by Samuel, anointed by the tribe of Judah, anointed by the 11 remaining tribes. He has the full anointing, and now he goes out in anything he does. If he thinks about something, it prospers. <laughs> That's what that anointing looked like on the prophet Samuel, but now it is passed upon a king. David is not a man of words, but actions. And just as Samuel's words always came to pass, even so now, in like anointing, all of, God, all of David's actions prosper in his behalf. See, this is a level of walking with God that people have no conception of. But it is available. See, that's what righteousness means. 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus is our righteousness. That word means entitlement. And how does that look? That means everything you say and do becomes as effective as if God said it or did it. And with the risk of sounding like I don't know what humility is, let me tell you something. I've probably spent more time in that anointing than out of it in the last eight years. There's been times not everything turned out the way I wished it would have. But there have been many, many seasons of our life that everything we put our hand to, it prospered. It succeeded. It accomplished. It maximized. It stretched its capacity. <laughs> this is the purpose of this chapter is to teach you how to conduct yourself when everything you do prospers. When you get out in your life and suddenly you're in that season where everything you say and do is going to prosper. And God's, God just looks at you and says, just get out there and do something. Go ahead and make a mistake. I'll even make your mistakes to prosper. It's a sweet spot we've talked about. If you don't believe he won't make your mistakes to prosper, just look at Ishmael. He was Abraham's mistake and he prospered. Think about that. There's a flip side to that, I would have you know. So much of Christian teaching is about how to live in failure, defeat, and unanswered prayer, and unchecked oppression of the enemy. We'll understand it better by and by. In this old world below, filled with trouble, sorrow, and woe, I got news for you. That's not what Jesus died for. No way. We've taught people how to stay in love with Jesus and live with total contradiction to his promise in their life. And that's good. We need to stay in love with Jesus, even if we're not experiencing what he promised. But we also need to teach people how to walk in the kingdom. How to be priests in the earth. Pardon the interruption. Go ahead. We're Thank still you. here. We're still here. <laughs> I hope you are. Yes, they're there. We feel them. <laughs> so much of Christian teaching. Here we see the example of David maintaining humility and obedience while realizing that God had given him a blank check endorsement in life to fulfill the will of the Father. Just as the anointing on Samuel came to David, just as the anointing on Samuel came to David, that which is intended ultimately to be on Jesus and to be imparted to you and I. This is what we call the sure mercies of David. Now understand, it wasn't Samuel's anointing. It was something given by God to Samuel, released to King David, and then sent down David's bloodline to Jesus. Now bear in mind that this anointing first came to Saul, but did not prosper him as it did David. 
Remember when we read how that the uh, the Spirit of the Lord left when Samuel anointed David, the Spirit of the Lord left Saul and went to David? Do you realize that the anointing that was upon Saul that Samuel, that Samuel released was the Christ anointing that came upon Jesus when John the Baptist baptized him? That anointing was something that had been in the earth in the bloodline of David for generations. Mm -hmm. And it was activated in Jesus. It was in him and it was activated in him because uh, Jesus went about doing good, performing miracles, completely unchecked by the enemy. Always remember Romans 1.3. It says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the Spirit of Holiness, which means the Holy Spirit. What that means is Jesus was delineated. He was established as the Son of God in the earth. He was pointed out as the Son of God in the earth not by his sinless birth, but by the Holy Spirit that what came upon him when John baptized him, the same Holy Spirit that he's given to you and I. And that Holy Spirit is the same Spirit that was released upon Saul when Samuel anointed him, and then left Saul and went to David when David was anointed, and then stayed in Saul's bloodline until Jesus, and was activated in Jesus, and he turned around and he gave it to us. It was, and it is today, the Christ anointing. The same anointing that you and I have as believers was at one time in the horn of Samuel, whenever God told Samuel, fill your horn with oil and go. Mm -hmm. And he poured that out upon David, and through David's bloodline it came down to Jesus, and Jesus covenantally gave it to us upon the cross, and, and he ratified his right to do so in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And what you see David doing and putting down all rule and every enemy uh, from the Nile to the Euphrates is exactly the anointing that's upon you to establish your borders and your boundaries. Amen. Take the land, huh? Read verse 7 through 12. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadad Ezer. Hadad Ezer. And brought them to Jerusalem from Beth and from the cities of Hadders. Hey, Dad Ezer. Hey, Dad <laughs> King David took exceeding much brass. When Toy, the king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the hosts of Hey, Dad Ezer. That's you. <laughs> then Toy sent Jordan, his son, unto the king David to salute him and to bless him because he had fought against Hadazer and smitten him for Hadazer had war. Wars with Toy and Joram brought with him vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of brass, which were also King, which also King David did dedicate to the Lord with the silver and the gold that he had dedicated of all nations which he subdued, of Syria and of Moab and of the children of Ammon and of the Philistines and of Amalek and of the spoil of Hadassar, bless you, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. Now, if you look at these seven nations, you know how Joshua defeated seven nations? Well, David defeated seven nations as well. The Philistines, the Moabites, the Amorites, the Amalekites. And if you look up all of their names, they mean something that you have to defeat inwardly, just as the Philistines means to wallow, the Moabites means inbred. Inbred. Oh, wow. And that's a real problem in the church. The church has more in common with the tribe of Moab than anything else. Because you got to think like us, act like us, talk like us, believe like us, and we don't even consider you a Christian if, you don't, if you're not like us. If you're not inbred, mm. then you're not even a believer. Right. Because you got to be inbred like us. But it's time for that. Why do you think... I well, can't go there. It's a whole conversation. But Why was David pushing back his borders with such ferocity? Because in Genesis 15, 18, God gave Abraham all the lands from the Nile up to the river Euphrates. David knew by the word of the Lord what his borders were, and he was taking God at his word. He had the personal prophecy of Noah to his granddaddy Shem. He had the personal prophecy that uh, God gave to Abraham in Genesis 15, establishing his borders. And he was taking what God told his granddaddy, and he was taking it personally, a generational prophetic word that he was pursuing and was winning great victories. See, you can look to the word of God and see what your boundaries and your borders are. David could have settled for peace in his borders, the ones he inherited from Saul, but he did not. God is not, you realize that 
David had not slain ten thousands at the time that the women sang, Saul has slain his thousands, David has slain his ten thousands. David had just killed one giant. Mm -hmm. But the women, the handmaidens of Israel, where are the handmaidens today? Come on. That though we have not brought the nations to heal in the things of God, but yet where are the handmaids that will say, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands? That they prophesied in the city, a yes. prophetic city, oh, a relevant prophetic prophetic culture, a relevant prophetic uh, generation that was being raised up and were seeing by the Spirit. In other words, the women knew what was going on while all the men were still figuring it out. It took the men 10 years to figure out what the, what the little handmaidens knew when David came back in dragging the sword of Goliath behind him and hanging on to that head, that bloody trophy of Goliath's head, and they saw what God was doing. So men, we got we to gotta start listening to the prophetic spirit that's Amen. in the women Amen. because the women get it when the men take 10 years of war and bloodshed to figure it out. Come on, we need our you go <laughs> girls in the kingdom. Amen. See, the promises of God are the ley lines of your spiritual and natural borders. We do not accept the boundaries of man or the circumstance the devil has set before us. God will be with us in the boundaries of his promises. As in Joshua's day, there were many giants in the land, but God will not fail to honor his word. David knew what the promise to Abraham was. He expected within those boundaries that every victory would be won, and that was, in fact, the outcome. God does not expect us to sit back in timidity and fear, cowering till the end of life. Always remember that the word of God, remember what Jesus said? that he'll say, well done, D-O-N-E, mm -hmm. good and faithful servant. Walking with God is more than words and beliefs. But yet Christian culture primarily facilitates the assimilation of words and beliefs. But you can't do much sitting in the pew other than making a spitball and shooting it at the guy up, and up ahead of you. It's more than words and it's more than beliefs. It's about doing something. We need to put a retro rocket. We need to roll a gantry up like the space shuttle to these pews and fire people out into the marketplace. We need to have bail funds equivalent to our building funds and send people out like Samson tied the fox's tails together, sent them out in the Emony's barley fields uh -huh. uh, to raise up the people who go out and do something because it's in the doing. Well done, good and faithful servant, not well believed. Right. Not well believed, not, not passive. Be the things doers. of God are not passive. We must be doers. We must do something. We must take God at his word and move forward in life expecting his promise to come to pass and that you will not be disappointed. And if it doesn't work out the way you hoped it would, I would rather uh, step out to believe for something audacious and fail than to sit back with all of the armchair critics in the seat of the mocker that Samuel uh, Psalm 1 talks about. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a careful failure. I don't want to try to do nothing and succeed. That's right. Verse 13 through 18. Verse 13, And David got him a name when he returned from smiting of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, uh, being 18,000 men. And he put garrisons in the in Edom throughout all of Edom put he garrisons of all the all of Edom became David's servants and the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went and David reigned over all Israel and David executed judgment and justice to all his people and Joab the son of Zeruah was over the host and Jehoshaphat the son of Eliu 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 <laughs> something like that was recorder and Zadok the son of Anatub and uh, Hemelech the son of Abiathar were priests, were the priests, and Sariah was the scribe, and Beniah, the son of Jehodiah, was over the Chetherites. And the Pelethites. And the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief rulers. So David, may, David's mighty men of war, he was a man of war toward his enemies, but as he was a king of justice and prudence toward his people. He didn't neglect what was taking place in his own borders among the people. He set up leaders, and we see in the last part of the chapter the form and organization of his government. 
Notice that there was no description like this in Saul's reign because Saul did not organize or put in order his kingdom in behalf of the people. Why? Everything we know of Saul's administration was the meticulous effort he went to protect himself from the people because he didn't trust them. Mm -hmm. We spend so much time organizing the control of the people. Oh, no, you can't stand up and prophesy. Uh, oh, no, you can't go out and do that unless you ask the church permission to do that. Oh, no, we don't want you doing that. No, you don't have permission to do that. What are they doing? They're protecting themselves. They're putting credibility before kingdom. Whereas David was the exact opposite. He was there to serve the people, to facilitate the people, to cultivate the people, to encourage the people, to expand the borders and the boundaries and the blessings of the people. Whereas all of Saul's administration was geared toward keeping everything under control so that something that was important to them didn't get somehow messed with or damaged in any way. David knew he couldn't do these things alone. He had a general to manage the army. He had a historian to maintain a record of things that were done and keep other important records. He wanted his rule to be with consistency. He didn't want to contradict himself, so Elahad uh, recorded all that took place so this wouldn't happen. And then there was Zadok. He was the priest, and he was particularly loyal to David. From Zadok's line, the Sadducees eventually emerged. If you looked at the etymology of the name Sadducee, it's the Hebrew word Zadok. It's a Zadokian order. Uh, and, of course, they didn't quite do their job in Jesus' day. They supported David, but they didn't support King Jesus. And uh, ben Beniah was one of David's original mighty men, and he had the oversight of David's personal guard. And David's sons were chief administrators as well in David's kingdom. This was the golden age of David's rule. And in time to come, yes, David will err and difficult times will come. But this is a time of glory and blessing that we must not overlook. Because there will be times in your life that you will experience this blessing as well. The thing that, that I like the most about this chapter is how David was pushing with his army to the border of the Euphrates. He was taking God at his word, and his vision was to establish a kingdom from the Nile to the Euphrates because that was what God had promised him. And God's made you some promises. Sometimes people listen to, I get prophecies for people, and I'm like, God, I'm going to have to, to, to dilute that somehow because if I say that, they're going to think I'm just just what realtors say, I'm puffing, I'm exaggerating, because I see things for people that are off the rails beyond anything I could ever imagine. I see thousands of souls being touched, lives being changed, the kingdom being established, and you know, you got a little housewife in, in front of you, and she's just trying to believe God, you know, to get through to next week's groceries, and uh, that's one thing, As a, when I was a pastor in a traditional church, I kept getting in trouble because I had more faith for the people than they had for themselves. Right. Because when I looked at them, all I, I cannot look at you and say anything other than the potential of God in your life. I cannot look at you and say, march in place till Jesus comes. I cannot look at you and say, hold the fort for he is coming. I cannot uh, advise you to march in place. Uh, till the rapture. And when I look at you, I see that God's kingdom come. I see his will being done. I see that written across your heart, all things are possible, only believe. And I'm going to strap you into an ejection seat and launch you into orbit so that you can rain down fire and, and judgment on the, on the enemy of God and, yes, God and grab hold of all those bound souls and take them out of the paw of the bear in the mouth of the lion for the glory of God. I don't. I can't look at you and see failure. I can't look at you and see anything but his kingdom come, his will be done from the Nile to the Euphrates. We have a promise, and we have an inheritance. And that which took David uh, uh, centuries ago, millennia ago, and established his boundaries and his borders, that audacity is within you, and it's not just a mental approach. It is an anointing imparted to us from King Jesus. And we're in covenant with him, and we need to rise up and move into our possessions and to be who God called us to be. Yes, indeed. So, Father, we say we stand up, we rise up to the place that you have for us, our destiny comes into focus more clearly now. We pray that you would 
Help us clean the glasses of our spiritual eyes so we can see what the Spirit of the Lord is saying more detailed, more fully, so that we enlarge our territories. You said that's an okay prayer to pray with Jabez, and that you would enlarge our borders and strengthen our stakes, that you would spread us out to the left and the right, Father, so that we don't miss anything you want us to be responsible over. And we establish the territories, but not by might and not by military power, but by the spirit of the living God. And we're not afraid to say who we are and whose we are, who we belong to, Father. We're not ashamed of this precious gospel of Jesus Christ. For That's the good news. It's the power of God into salvation, and that's saving us from everything we need saved from. And we thank you, Father, for clearing our glasses and helping us to see now with 2020 spiritual vision all that you have for us so we can pray into it and speak into it. In the name of Jesus, amen.